So, now it's just could be a bit louder. Yeah, okay. So welcome to today's lecture. So last week, Chris introduced you to a wonderful Pandas library, which is an abstraction around uh, tabular data, which has labels and indices and provides a lot of nice uh, operations on it and index patterns and now that you know how you can put data into pandas data frames and get data out again we will talk about the semantics of the data that you have in your data frame and what's the best way to organize the data to actually have a uh, have it easily or to have it usable uh, for a long time and get the most out of your data and so this uh, whole complex is uh, under the name of cleaning data and uh, some people say that when working with data, we spend like 80% of the time just cleaning the data. And uh, that might be a bit exaggerated, but it's definitely a very important part of the whole process. And it's also where you can, if not spend most of the time, lose most of the time, because if you do not clean your data at the beginning, uh, you will do a lot of analysis and interpretation and modeling on data that doesn't make any sense. And then uh, you will have to redo it again. So you should really invest uh, in this part of your projects. So what will we cover today for cleaning data? We will talk about handling missing values, removing duplicates, structuring the data in the right way. That's actually the biggest part. And then sh something short about removing outliers. And in the next lecture, we will continue a bit uh, about putting uh, the right data types in place so you get a bit of extra safety. So as usual, the lecture is on Binder. You can follow along and you can uh, do the exercises there. And I will import uh, the counter maybe right now. Yeah, so I can do this later. OK, so let's start with talking about missing values. So what are missing values? Missing values can arise in the process of data collection or when data is pushed around or very often when data formats change during uh, the process of time so that at some point you will have fields in your tables that do not have any values. So the first question is how do we represent these values? So one choice that we could make is uh, for every value in our data frames, we reserve an extra bit and say, OK, uh, if the bit is set, then the value is missing. So that's, for example, the approach that R takes. In Python, it's a bit different. So the other approach would be to have a so-called sentinel value to uh, be a placeholder for a missing value. And that is what we do in Python. We have a special value for missing numbers called NAN, which stands for not a number. And we also have the value non, which is like from the um, normal Python language and which is used to represent uh, missing data that is not numerical. So these missing uh, sentinel values have sometimes a bit strange semantics when you think about the quality of them. Because what I should actually do is also remove uh, or clear the output. So it's, yeah. So as you already saw, uh, if you say, OK, and so the not a number value is provided by NumPy. And if you say not a number equals not a number, it just says false, even though we can obviously see that these are the same expressions. So that is because the semantics of not a number means it represents a number that we do not know. And now to say that those numbers would, e would equal each other would be to say, OK, we have two things which we don't know the value of, and we say that those are equal. And this wouldn't make any sense. So if you think about it that way, this is why uh, none doesn't equal none. Uh, however, so to be completely correct, we would have to say, OK, we cannot say something about the quality of these numbers, but to make operations a bit more uh, easy, especially when we do vectorized comparison, it just says false. However, uh, there is uh, then a helper function provided by Pandas, which, which we can ask whether a value is uh, not a number or more generally not available. So if we say PD is an A uh, of np none, we get true. So this is how we can query our data for being missing. And if we see, OK, if we apply this to a value that is obviously not missing, we will see that we get false for this. So let's view this in the context, uh, in a bit more applied context. So here we load some data about the Ebola epidemic in uh, yeah, 2014, I believe. So and if we look at this, um, I'm wondering. 
maybe clean the output did not work work as intended clear all outputs <laughs> okay yeah much better okay so we load the data set and we take a look at it and it says okay we have some dates here and we have some days here and then we have for each date we have the cases uh, the number of cases and the number of deaths in different countries in which uh, Ebola was present during that time and you already see that we have some missing values here. So and first thing that we do is we sort by the day to uh, get a bit better overview and we see okay especially here in the beginning we have a lot of NAN values. So now the question is how do we deal with these NAN values because if we would want to do an, an analysis uh, on based on this data all the values that I have NAN are not very usable. So, and even if we look at, for example, if we look at the column of cases in Guinea and we take the value counts and we especially say that we want to include the NA values in the count, we see, okay, even the majority of counts is uh, especially NAN and like 29 values are missing from here. So the simplest approach would be to simply drop all the entries that have missing values. So we could simply say uh, data frame dot drop NA and the result that we get is uh, a bit bad because we only are left with a single row now because mm -hmm. all the other rows contained at least a single NA value. So this is why dropping in L values uh, just uh, completely is of course the most correct one but it's often very impractical because if you have a lot of different uh, variables it is very likely that at least one of them will contain uh, an A value so we lose a lot of data. However, we could change the strategy a bit and say, okay, let's only drop the rows in which all values are NA, uh, not available. However, then again, we do not really get rid of any values because <laughs> all the uh, all rows contain most often at least a single value. But this can be useful if, for example, you have really messed up data and there are rows that are completely not available, then you can just drop them because they don't really help each, uh, us. <coughs> So a bit more sophisticated strategy would be to fill the missing values with some uh, other value that uh, yeah, we compute by in some way or the other. Um, so the simplest way is just we say, okay, fill an A with zero. And then we see, okay, all the missing values that we had here before are now uh, filled with a zero value. So this is an uh, easy solution. However, you must be aware that whenever you uh, uh, replace some missing values with some actual values, you always introduce a bias in your data. So now we say, okay, if we do not know the value, then there probably weren't any cases. So we could say, okay, if there weren't any cases reported, probably the outbreak hadn't, hasn't started yet, so there just weren't any cases. But it could also be that the situation was so bad that no cases could be reported, and we now introduce a heavy bias in the data that does not reflect the actual situation. So what we could also do instead is, let's say, uh, use some statistics of our data set and replace the missing values with those statistics. So for example, we could compute the mean of our data frame and just calling mean on this, as you saw, like gives us a series in which each column name is mapped to the mean of that column. And then we can also pass the result of this to fill in A because fill in A either takes like a constant value or takes a dictionary-like object in which, uh, which maps uh, column names to values and now all the missing values will be imputed by uh, the value that we computed here before. So now we replace all the missing values with a mean. This is maybe a bit more realistic, but always depends on the context. But even here we introduce this bias and say, okay, now we make our whole distribution of data even closer, closer to the mean because we replace a lot of values with the mean that we had before. So there are also more advanced strategies for imputing missing values. You, some of you might know and maybe also hate the expectation maximization algorithm from <coughs> machine learning. It's because it's uh, notoriously hard to understand, but actually on the high level, I think it's uh, fairly reasonable. And yeah, but this is not directly implemented in Pandas, so we will not cover it here. Um, but you should be aware that sometimes you might need more sophisticated strategies, and then there are also other algorithms. So then there's also another strategy for filling missing values, uh, which makes most sense when you have sequential data, so often for time series data or so. And this would be to forward fill or backward fill the data. 
So we could say uh, when you fill the NA values, we specify the method as uh, f fill, so forward fill. And what this does is, okay, we see here not really anything, but if we look at the tail of the data, we see, okay, we have missing values here as well. And if we forward fill and look at the tail, we see now, okay, these values are now um, uh, filled with some value. And what is actually happening when we forward fill, okay, we look at, for each missing value, we look at the, uh, we look at our previous value and then we take the first value that is not an A. So for example, here we say, okay, we go down, okay, here's a non-missing value, now we have a missing value, so we basically drop down these values to all the missing values below. And the assumption is that if you have sequential data that just the data stays cons uh, constant uh, be before, uh, between the last observed uh, point and the next observed point. Yes? Yes. Oh no, so so you would basically, so if you have, okay, I should have cleaned the blackboard, I thought about it, but <laughs> I didn't do it. Um, okay, where's the sponge thingy? Ah. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah, so if we have one and then we have like missing, uh, missing and then we have two and missing and missing let's say and then we would go down and say okay here's the one okay here we put the one here we put the one then we put the two and then we put the two and the two so you always like look at the last non-missing value and uh, replace yeah basically replace every missing value with the last non-missing value that came before So with these, this, we still have the problem that now if we have missing values at the top uh, of our sequence, we do not get any values filled for it. So there's also the opposite direction, which is called backward fill. And if we do this, we see, okay, we don't get now uh, the missing values stay at the bottom. But if we look instead at the head, um, then we see that now the missing values are filled. And this is like looking at the last non-missing value that came after the missing value. And so if you want to fill all your missing values with this fill strategy, then you would need to first forward fill and then backward fill or the other way around, whichever you think makes more sense. Okay, then this question now, if we for some reason cannot really get rid of our missing values, how can we still do calculations with them? So the sad truth is that uh, if we have any operations that involve missing values, now for example like a sum, uh, we cannot really make any statement about the result of that sum because if it's like, uh, if we have some sum and we add some missing value to it, we do not know what the value of the sum would be. So this is the approach that NumPy takes, however this is not very practical. So instead what Pandas does by default, it just ignores all the missing values. So it computes the sum as if the missing values would not be there at all. So if for some reason you do not want this behavior but want to make sure that you do not have any missing values involved in your calculations, you can explicitly specify that you do not want to skip the not available values. And if on the other way around you want to compute with NumPy with missing values, I think there are also these, often these non uh, whatever op uh, versions of a lot of operations. So you can also use this then. Okay, so that's it for missing values. So then let's talk about duplicates. So dupli duplicates also arise when, yeah, often when the data processing is somehow messed up or so, and best thing is just to get rid of them. So let's for consider the following data frame where we have two columns A and B, and uh, not really much du is duplicated here, but the last row is like the same. So row five is the same as row four. So if this is not really meaningful, we should discard it, and what we can do is we can ask for all the duplicated um, values in our data frame. So if we say data frame not duplicated, we get a Boolean sequence, and uh, we get for each row, we get um, uh, the information whether it is duplicated, so whether the exact same row has been seen before or not. So in this case, ro only row five is a duplicate of row four, so we get true here and false otherwise. 
Might also be that our semantics is a bit different, so already a duplication in a subset of the columns would mean a duplicated value, so we could also say, okay, uh, subset, just, for, just look for column A, and then we would see, okay, these are all duplicates, these are all duplicates, because we have here one, 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 and then two, 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 so these two are duplicates of the first row, and these two are duplicates of row three. So and then, uh, luckily, Pandas provides also a function which is drop duplicates, and we can all just do this, and then it will take the result of duplicated, so to say, and drop all the rows where uh, duplicated return true. Yeah, so that's the idea. So this is something that you should always check when you get a new data set and check for whether there are duplicates in your data, and if those duplicates actually make any sense, or whether it's just, uh, yeah, for some reason. Uh, bullshit and you should just discard the values. <coughs> so with this we get to our first exercise. So uh, I, um, this time we have a lot to deal with Pokemons again, so I think you already had something in your homework with that and I hope you still all can relate to Pokemon, <laughs> so <laughs> this is uh, also fun for you. So in this case we have uh, our Pokemon data set which contains I think all the Pokemons and now the, uh, the task would be to keep only the, uh, to find out like the first Pokemon in each generation that was added to the series and you can use drop duplicates for this task and yeah, you can find out how and I will give you like, I don't know, four minutes for this task. Um, I do not think so actually. Could be an extra, could be worth an extra check. <laughs> but so really the task would be like to find only a, a single Pokemon for each generation. So in this case, uh, I think the name would not be so important. So this is uh, like, the solution is not that difficult actually. Just have to say, okay, I want to drop the duplicates and we restrict the detection of duplicates to the subset of the generation. So this in this way we only get the first Pokemon of each generation and um, not sure like uh, which are these, but we can see that at least a lot of generations, like all except one, start with a grass Pokemon. So, okay, so next uh, topic, really biggest topic of this lecture would is tidy data. So the question is, how do we structure our data? Now we have uh, rows and columns and we have different tables and we can put our data basically everywhere. So the question is, if, is there a, a sensible structure to uh, use for our data such that we can uh, reuse it later on in an easy fashion? And the answer is that whenever there's a difficult question in data science, there's usually one guy that provides an answer to it. And this is Hadley Wickham in this case. So. Um, Adley Wickham is one of the most prolific uh, contributors to open source data science and scientific software. And uh, one problem is just that he does everything in R. So, um, however, we can still use, the uh, use his concepts and apply them to Python and they are just as useful as they are um, in, in the R language. So, how does uh, tidy data look like according to Hadley Wickham? So he wrote a paper about it where he explained it and this is now a quote from the paper and then he says, okay, tidy data sets are easy to manipulate, model and visualize and have a specific structure. Each variable is a column, each observation is a row and each type of observation or unit is a table. And further on, the data set is a collection of values, usually either numbers if quantitative or strings if qualitative. Values are organized into ways, every value belongs to a variable and an observation. A variable contains all values that measure the same underlying attribute, like height, temperature, duration, across units. An observation contains all values measured on the same unit, like a person or a day or a race, across attributes. So this seems like a very sensible thing. So the question is, what could possibly go wrong with this? So actually a very lot can go wrong when you get data sets. So it could be that, for example, column headers are values instead uh, and not variable names, or you have multiple variables stored in one column, or you have variables stored in both rows and columns, or you have multiple types of observational units in the same table, or you have also single observations uh, scattered across multiple tables. 
So we will now go all through these different cases in which data can be untidy, and we will uh, learn some methods of how to deal with this untidiness of the data. So let's start cleaning this up. So the first case would be column headers are not uh, are values and not variable names. So to illustrate this problem, we look at the so-called pew data set. So not sure why this is called pew. However, uh, the data set contains uh, information about um, the relation between religion and income. So different people were asked uh, for their income and also for their religion. And then this is put into a table and we see how, okay, for the peer agnostic people, there were 27 who had income below 10,000, so probably a year, and then 81 between 30 and 40,000, and this for all the religion and for all these different categories of incomes that you could fall in. Um, so given the like definition about tidy data that we just heard, so what do you think is untidy about this data set? So maybe to look again at the definition, it says, okay, each variable is a column and each observational unit is a row. So um, do you think that, uh, like what would be the observational unit of, yeah? Um, so that we have the religion in the, in the columns and the incomes. Mm, yeah, that would also be like, have a similar problem. Like, what do you think would be the observational unit when we make like uh, a survey like this? Or what, what do we actually measure when we, uh, like a single measurement of a survey that asks for both religion and income? Yeah. Yeah, so the really the single observation would be just uh, has like the variables just religion and income, and you would say, okay, you have uh, the religion and next uh, the income. However, this is already a bit aggregated, so we could say, okay, we have the religion, then we have the income group, and then we have the number of people that uh, like fall into this category. So this would be a way to, to express this in a tidy fashion, so to say, given that it's already aggregated. And for this, we need to use a method that's called melting. So melting means that if we have a data frame in a, so to say, wide format where we have more columns than rows necessarily, and now what we do is we melt the data frame down. This is, and probably it's called melt because it usually becomes then longer than wide, and maybe if you melt something, then it also would be like uh, flow down or something. So the idea would be here if we have like these four columns here, and now we say, okay, we want to melt this, and we want to keep those, then we would put like these things into a new variable column, and we put, and we would put the corresponding values into a new value column. And so the same thing is what we can do for the pew data set. We just say melt and id vars equals religion. So in this case, we get the format that we desired. We now have we keep religion as a column, but now we also have a new variable column that contains the income group and we have a value that contains the counts of uh, the people that fall into this category. So because, and id vars in this, case, in this case specifies like the variables that uh, serve as an identifier for the observational unit. Uh, so in this case, uh, yeah, religion is part of the identifier and now also this is part of the identifier, but uh, this naturally like uh, became part of the identifier because the grower was in a column before, the values were in columns before, so we need to specify all the, all the columns that us are already identifiers. So this is now a bit uh, not so nice that we have variable and value as a name here, so uh, MELT also provides the opportunity to rename those columns directly, so we could say the variable name should be income and the value name should be count, and now we have a very tidy form of this data set here. So another example for melting something uh, from this untidy format is the billboard data set. So let's look at those. So the billboard data set contains information about the like chart ranks of different songs, I think starting from 2000 or so, and it contains uh, for each year and uh, for basically for each song, it contains the rank in the chart that it, uh, to, uh, that it had starting from the first week that it entered the chart. So in this case here, uh, the 
song band of Matchbox 20, or a better example, song Nation of Kerncraft 400, entered uh, in week one and placed 99, so just made it in, stayed in week 99 for week two, and then dropped out of the charts again, so it, all the other values are none. And this is how you interpret this data set. So again, given what we now know about tidy data, what do you think is untidy about this data set? Or how should we change it to make it tidy? Okay, again, maybe you think about like what would be the observational unit, what is, uh, what is a single observation that we can make in this case. Do we observe uh, like a song being in the chart for uh, 76 weeks at once? Yeah, so the idea is right that we should have a look at a single week, but still again, like what we have here, like the, the song that is actually in there is also part of the observational unit. So you would say like really a single observation is you observe this song being in the chart in this position in this week. So this is like the, the smallest observational unit that you can have here. And this is also the format that we try to achieve next. So and in this case, we use uh, more uh, values for ID variables and we specify a whole list. So now we say, okay, each observational unit is identified uh, by the things that are already uh, correct, variable columns by year, artist, track, time, and date entered. And then we say, okay, we want to have the week and the value as a rank. And we look at this and this is now how it looks. So now we have each, <coughs> each row is now observation and tells us, okay, uh, in the year 2000, the artist uh, Yankee Gray was found in uh, was not found in the chart in week say, uh, 76. So we could also maybe get some more interesting data, or maybe we get this right away. So yeah, because now we see we now that we have we have a lot of observations that are more or less meaningless. Because now we say often, okay, this artist wasn't in the chart in uh, wasn't in the chart in week uh, 76 after it entered, but uh, this is probably true for a lot of songs that they were not present in this time. So we could simply say, okay, let's drop all the NA values in this case and look at the tail, and now we get only uh, values that contain actual uh, information, or well, like information that we couldn't derive otherwise. So and then it's always a good idea to sort the values, so we can just call sort values. Uh, on the result of this and say, okay, we want to sort by artist and track, and then we see, okay, that here Tupac was in the charge in, uh, in the charts in 2000. So, and maybe a general remark about this form of uh, dealing with data. So I find it very useful to do it like this, that you start with your data frame. So you start with the data and then you wrap the whole expression in parentheses right away. And then you can just uh, call methods on this data frame and uh, what you can do, you can more or less endlessly chain methods calls to your data frame. So in this way, we start here. Let's maybe do it like this. Like what I always often do when I develop uh, interactively, I say, okay, I start with an operation and say, okay, this is now the melted data frame. Mm, okay, I see uh, I have a lot of NA values. So let's next, let's drop the NA values here. So and I can just like do a dot and then call the method right away because melt would already return a data frame. So I can just continue calling methods on this data frame and this like technique is called method chaining. And it's very uh, like a very nice way to deal with the API and also very concise way. Now we would see, okay, now we dropped in L values, but it's not very sorted. So let's sort the values. And then in the end we say, okay, but I just want to look, take a look at the head. And so this is how we get there. Okay, so now you can practice the concept of melting stuff again with the Pokemon. So uh, here we have a data frame that contains the mean health points per generation and type. So in this case, we have the generation here and we have uh, the different types on the, on the columns. And now we like each cell contains what is the average HP per the, for this combination. And now you should transform this to a data tidy format and you should also think about what a tidy format could mean in this case. So, and you have like five minutes for this. Yeah, and ask questions if you have any.
Okay, so who did come up with the solution for this? Okay, great. What was your solution? Yeah. Any? Yeah, that sounds good. So it's also what we have here. So we say, okay, we say we want to keep the generation and we put the type into a proper variable and we turn the HP into a value column and then we only have these three columns left and then we can say, okay, we observe in each generation or like in generation one, the type bug has an uh, average health points of 55 or so. And this would be like the tidy format for this kind of data here. Yeah, okay, so the next thing that can go wrong is multiple variables are stored in one column. So this is often when you s what you see when people enter man data manually, maybe in an Excel spreadsheet or so, you have one column, but maybe the column is not really specified, or can you can have multiple things there, and people just separate things by commas or white space, or often also changing things. Uh, so this can be really a headache for uh, the people dealing with the data afterwards. So to illustrate this problem, let's look at the tuberculosis data set here. So this contains uh, data about uh, the number of tuberculosis in different years and different, um, different age groups and different sexes. So this would be like uh, the male people uh, from the year zero to four, so uh, male babies. Uh, yeah, we never had so much tuberculosis, but maybe also never, no one had tuberculosis in those years because <laughs> maybe the data wasn't recorded. So let's uh, maybe look instead of the tail of the data. Um, yeah, so here we see, okay, these are also different countries, I believe. Uh, so these are ISO codes for different countries, and then we could say, okay, here are also females from uh, 15 to 24, there were 1,140 uh, cases of tuberculosis. So the problem here is that now we, so the observational unit would be, okay, we observe in this, in this country, in this year, in this uh, sex, in this age group, we observe this uh, case count of uh, tuberculosis cases. So however, now we have like these two groups uh, merged together, or these like the sex and the, um, the age group merged together in this, in a single column. So first thing that we do now, we melt this, uh, to a bit more sane format, we say, okay, we keep the the, uh, the country and the year, and we now we want to uh, melt down the demographics, now we call it, and the count, and then we have something here, information about the demographics, and here we have the count, if there is any. And in the process, we could also rename a column like this ISO2, we just rename to country, so to make it a bit more readable, this is also often a good uh, pros practice in the process of data cleaning that uh, sometimes you have some variable names that just have like values that are probably meaningful to the people collecting the data but not to you, so just rename it in this case. So and now we can look here uh, at the D types and we see, okay, not sure if we already talked about pandas D types, but we say that in general in pandas it's that way, like either things are numeric, so if you have ins or floats or so, then you have a float data type, but if you have something else, or already if you have strings, you have a data type of object. So in this case, we see, okay, country, like demographics is object, so this means that it is, in this case, a string. There could also be other Python objects in the list, but usually when you see object, it just means strings. And maybe in coming up on this version, there will also be proper data types for string, but for now we just have to deal with the object. So, and now how can we split these uh, data that was magnet together in a single column? So for this, we can use the method of uh, vectorized string operations. So you already know like vectorized operations are numbers. If I have a vector and I say, okay, I say plus one, the one is added to each uh, element in the vector. And so the same thing holds for string columns in pandas. And we can do like the string operations that we know from standard Python in a vectorized manner just by a single call. And for this, we need the .str accessor. So if we have like a string column here, and we access this demographics, and now we say .str, we get a reference to a vectorized version of the string column. And then we can just use uh, standard methods like string slicing to slice uh, each element of the entire column. 
So we can do here, we say, okay, we assign uh, a column sex and we say, okay, give me everything except the first letter and uh, or give, give me just the first letter and here give me everything except the first letter for the age. And we add this to the data frame and now we see that we got two new columns. So and now this column only contains the first letter of demographics and this contains all the other letters contained in demographics. So now we already split this in a nice manner. Um, however, we still have the problem that, oh no, so just as an alternative, um, what you can also do is you can, if you have like more complex patterns where you cannot say, okay, this is separated by uh, just like the first letter is this and the rest is this. Often you have the problem that you need more complex uh, patterns to extract the data out of these string columns, especially like when you have humans entering the data and then there are variable separators and white space and whatever. Then you can also use the extract method. So you can do dot .str dot .extract and then you pass a regular expression. So uh, who of you is familiar with regular expressions? Okay, almost everyone, that's very good. So this is like an invaluable tool for data cleaning. So in here you can just pass a regular expression and then you say, okay, I have you specify the groups that you have in your regular expression just with parentheses and then you say something, uh, expand, uh, you set expand to true and this will lead to the uh, regular expression being applied to each element, the uh, things where the or the, the, the strings where the regular expression matches will be extracted. In this case, we have two groups. And then the groups will be expanded into a data frame. So if we just look maybe at just at this expression here, we see that we get a data frame back from this where the uh, first return, uh, so just where with two columns where the first is, uh, yeah, here in this case we said F or M, and uh, then the second is the rest. and this is also can be a bit better also for extracting this because here we assume that just the first letter is uh, information about um, whether it's male or female, but it might actually be also something else that is messed up and just with this strategy we would not immediately notice it while here we get uh, feedback about or we can uh, say it more directly that we only want to have letters uh, F and M. So we can assign this back to our data frame using a syntax where we have like uh, square brackets and then inside another list and this means assigned to both columns this data frame here on the right and then we get the same result we got uh, with splitting on the string or no with uh, yeah with this uh, slicing on the string okay so so the next exercise would be uh, somehow the text is missing but anyway so here we have uh, a new Pokemon data set where we have, uh, so usually the Pokemon have a first and a second type, but sometimes they don't. And what people did here is they replaced uh, the two type columns with a single type column where the two types are separated by a, uh, by a dash here and by white space around it. So if there are two types for the Pokemon, it looks like this. If there's only a single type, it looks like this. So now you should try if you can restore the original uh, state of the data frame using a vectorized string operation. And if you recall what string operations are available in uh, Python, you maybe you can also find a string operation that fits this situation very well. And you can try it out to if you can apply it here. Yeah, okay, so. It's like three minutes for that and Okay, so who was successful in restoring the original data frame? Okay, one person, okay. So let's look at the solution. Actually, it's not that difficult. So the idea here is to use, also if you look at the hint, there's also if there are vectorized versions of most uh, Python string operations, or I think even all, there's also a vectorized version of split. So in this case, we can say, okay, we want to split on uh, white space dash white space because it is what separates it here and then we say just expand equals true and then we make two new columns type one and type two again and we assign this back and we get 
so to say, the original state here where we have two type columns for each. And the good thing is that if you split on something that you cannot split, you, in this case, pandas make sure that we still get a, a proper data frame where the first value is extracted and then the second one is just set to none. So this is really like exactly what we wanted. So this is a nice solution. There's also the possibility to do it with a regular expression. So this would be a regular expression with which you could also uh, extract this data. However, I would advise you to first try the simple solutions with uh, like easier uh, string operations and then resort to regular expressions if the pattern is more complicated. Okay, so the next case would be variables are stored in both rows and columns. So um, Hadley Wickham says about this, the most complicated form of messy data occurs when variables are stored in both rows and columns. And yeah, the code below loads the weather data for the Global Historical Climatology Network for one weather station in Mexico for five months in 2010. So this is weather from Mexico here. Uh, we have the idea of the station that always remains same, and then we also have only the year 2000, and then we have like for each month, we have a row, uh, and we have two elements. So we have the minimum temperature and the maximum temperature. And then we have for each day, we have um, for each day in the month, we have, yeah, we have a column and we have a value there if something was, was measured. So maybe again, what, uh, if you think about it, what do you think would be a tidy form of this kind of information contained in this data set? So what kind of columns should we have instead of what we have here? Yes? Yeah, exactly. So that would be the tidy form that we say, okay, in this, on this date, so to say, so on this month, on this day, on this year, we observed a uh, minimum temperature of so and so and maximum temperature of so and so. Uh, because this is like these two are a single observation that you make on the same day, and this, these just belong together. You usually you do not observe a minimum temperature without a maximum temperature. So, and here we have the problem, like if we just had the day, we could just melt it, but now we also have like these values that are stored in the column here, but that actually should be row, uh, no, so the values that are stored in rows, but actually should be columns, and values that uh, are stored in columns that actually should be in the rows. So, again, we start by melting the data frame, so here we just call melt, and we say, okay, we identify a single record still by the idea, the year, the month, and for now also the element, and this is just melting down all the days. So we say, okay, give me a day variable with a value of temp, temp in this case, or temperature. And then we just assign this to a new data frame called weather melt. And if we look at this, okay, this already looks a bit better. But now we still have the problem of needing to do like the opposite operation and uh, turning these two values into columns here. And so what we do before that, we drop the NA values again because now we have a lot of things where we did not observe uh, something. Um, yeah, so exactly. And it's like we do not really need to keep this data because if there's no data available, we do not really, yeah, what should we do with it? So, okay, so now for the problem of the temperature of minimum, maximum, we have like this other operation called pivot. So pivot is really kind of the opposite of melt. And what it does here, let's say we have these columns here where we have a column called bar. And now we say, okay, but the values here should actually be uh, columns. So, and what we do is we take the column and turn it into a row. And because you can think of it like this uh, movement, it is called pivot because yeah, you kind of pivot the column into a row. And you do this by specifying an index, then the columns, and then the values. So you say, okay, uh, keep this as, uh, as a column, and then pivot this column uh, into, or pivot this, whoa, this, um, turn this into a column, and then these things that are here, that sh they should become like just values now. So if we look at the result of doing this here. So this method is called pivot table in pandas. So there's pivot and pivot table. Most of the time you just need pivot, but if you have multiple indices 
or you want to do an aggregation while pivoting, you have to use pivot table. So here we use pivot table in this case, and we say, okay, we still want to identify a record by the idea, the year, the month, and the day, but we want to turn the element uh, into the values in element into columns, and we want to take uh, the temperature as values. So in this case, now it looks like this. So we are already at our tidy format, and we now have the idea, the year, the month, the day, and then the minimum and maximum temperature in a single row. So this looks a little bit, a, little, uh, a bit like this here because now all these um, things are just not really columns yet, but are still indices. So now we have a multi-index for each row that contains uh, that consists of all those keys. This is not necessarily bad, but more often we want to have it as normal columns, so we can just call we set index after pivoting. And what we also do, uh, I'll just comment this out, so what normally uh, happens is that now we have element here, which is now the name of the column index. So and usually you do not really need the name of the columns index, so you can say columns.name, just uh, empty string. And then we get a data frame that looks as expected, where you have uh, yeah, the columns we expected. So now what we can do finally to make it a bit more clean is we can sort by year, month, day. So we get the values sorted uh, kind of in uh, what we would like to sort them according to the date. However, because uh, these are not numbers but strings instead, prefix with a day, which also doesn't have any meaning now anymore because if it says day in the column name, we do not need to have D in each value. So these are still strings, so we cannot sort it according to the numbers. So instead, what we need to do is we need to convert this into a, an integer. So this is already a bit about choosing the right data types to represent your data. So what we do here is we just uh, we take the string accessor, and then we just uh, slice away the first element, which is a D, and then we say S type int. And in this case, we will get uh, an integer column now, and now we can sort as expected on the day, but yeah, so <coughs> here we still have just, we start with 30 because we only have a single observation for this month and then like two and then it goes on as expected and there we have a lot of uh, gaps in between because at this point apparently no data was measured. So if you want to know more about, there's also a, a lot of pandas documentation on this reshaping of uh, things. But for now, let's just um, do another exercise. Here we have uh, a data set uh, about the attack statistics of uh, different Pokemon types. So we have the min, the mean, and the max uh, uh, attack value for each type. And your task again would be to turn this into a tidy format using what we just learned. And yeah, so I have like, let's say four minutes for this. Alright, so we was able to already tidy up the data. Okay, a few people. So yeah, this uh, you should use pivoting for this uh, task. And here the idea is you say, okay, the index is a type. You keep this as usual because it already is a proper variable. And then you turn the statistics into uh, the values below statistics into columns and you turn the values under attack into values. And after doing this, your data frame looks like this, and you have uh, type, max, min, and mean. And yeah, to maybe do this completely correct, we also have to reset the index. And then it looks like this. We have type, max, min, mean, and we know now these are the max, min, and mean attack values for each type. 
Okay, so the next thing, so this was now already the most problematic point. So now that we know melting and pivoting, we can get our data into a tidy state from more or less every position. So, however, there's still another complex that involves more uh, semantics of relational databases. Yeah. Mm, so actually, I'm not completely sure about this. If it's, I mean, it is possible, um, but to be honest, there's not really a good reason to change the order of uh, columns usually because, like, the the order of columns really doesn't have any meaning. You say, okay, my observation is always a single row, and whether I switch, uh, if you switch rows, you also switch uh, the column names. So the data should have the same meaning for this. But yeah, it's, it is possible. I think you can like slice uh, uh, slice parts of the data frame on the column axis and then concatenate the other way around or so, but usually it's not really necessary to do that. Okay, yeah, so the other problem would be, or like the next big uh, problem compound is having multiple types in one table. So if we look, um, so in general, do not repeat yourself is, uh, a standard uh, pattern in software engineering and it should also be a standard pattern in data engineering that you say, okay, I only have a single source of truth and this avoids uh, data getting into inconsistent states if I change the information only in one place. So if you have multiple types of, ob of observation in one table, you have redundancy and this can also lead to inconsistency. So if we again look at our billboard data set here, um, if we look more closely, we actually see that we have like kind of two types of observation. We have like uh, this song, so to say, that we depend on, but uh, then we also have um, the artist that is not really dependent on the song. So it could also be that uh, the same artist uh, has several songs in this uh, thing, and it would be a bit better to to split this into into different parts. So. Um, if we melt this down again by week uh, and rank and like so and then we sort by uh, and then we drop we see that we have like 5,300 uh, values however if we only look at, at the songs so to say if we only uh, slice out the artists that track the year and the time and we drop all the duplicates and then we set we make a new variable called song ID for which we just use the index of this new data frame. And then we look at uh, the songs. Um, we see that we actually only have 300 songs. So we have all these chart positions. We have like for many songs, we have like up to 67, uh, 76 chart positions, but we only have 300 songs. So it would be much better to keep the songs in one table and have the chart positions in a separate table and then just have a key by which we can uh, uh, make the relationship between a single song and an entry into the charts uh, again. And for this, we need the general method of merging things or joining things. So I don't know who of you is already familiar with like relational databases, SQL or something. A few, but not really many, okay. So this is actually a bit topic and I think there's like a whole lecture about uh, databases also where you learn a lot about uh, like also other topics, but I think mainly focusing around this uh, relational algebra and how you can express relations through tuples and uh, joining them together. But we will just go through it and I think it's like on a high level it's easy to understand. So <coughs> in general, um, when we have uh, two things and we want to join them on a key, like we have different uh, possibilities of doing that. So. Uh, let's consider the possibility of having like two sets, A and B, and now we want to make an inner join. And in this case, uh, an inner join is just uh, the overlap of these two sets, so to say. So if we look at this Venn diagram. And what we will do now is first we will look at like a simple Python implementation of these different joins, and I hope this helps to understand like the general semantics of joining things, and then we will look at how to do this in pandas. So let's consider that we have like two um, two things, left and right usually, 
and now we want to merge, uh, make we want to mer make an inner join or say a merge inner as a function. And the way this would happen is we would uh, have a list of things merged, and then we would iterate over everything in left and over everything in right. And we would say, okay, if left equals right, then uh, at an entry of a tuple of this exact value of left and right into our merged uh, list, and then return this. So in this case, if we merge this, we see, okay, we have different things here, but uh, only where it's equal, we put a tuple into into our result. So in this case, it is like like a union operation, no, not like a union, like an intersection, and we only keep like four, five, and six. So the things that were included in both uh, our original, so to say, data sets that where we just have list here. And um, maybe to have like another take on this again, you can also express this using uh, more general uh, concepts using iter tools, where we say, okay, we import this product function that makes like all possible combination of things. And then we say, okay, what we do first when we get left and right, we make all possible combinations of left and right, and then we kind of filter out all the things that are not equal. And this gives us the exact same result in this case. So uh, this is, for me, sometimes a bit easier to understand that we first make up the set of all possible solutions and then we filter out things that do not really uh, align with uh, our expectations. So uh, this would be what an inner join would do. Now there's also the possibility of doing a left join. So a left join is like an inner join plus everything that's on the left, so to say. Or you could also think of it like keep everything on the left and align the things from the right that match uh, the things on the left and discard everything else. So here again, we have like this simple implementation using iter tools and product. And we say, okay, if again, we make all, we first make all possible uh, candidates of solutions by making all the products between left and right. And then we say, okay, we iterate over each entry and candidates. And we say only if it's uh, equal appendix, so this is just the inner join. Uh, and then we say again, like uh, make a set of uh, from the left of everything that is emerged already. And then we say, okay, all the things that are not already in the solution set from the left side, add those and add those in a way that we only add the value from the left and none for the right, which means like, there wasn't a proper thing that uh, could align with uh, what we found on the right. So if we compare this again with uh, what's in left, we have like the values from one to six. So we have like for four, five, and six, we found a value that corresponds to it from the right side, but we did not find a value uh, for one, two, and three. And this, this is why we just put none in place of here because nothing from the right aligns to it. And the same same thing as you can do with the right join, which is just like the mirror uh, opposite of uh, doing a left join. So you know, also when we express this as a function, we can just say, okay, for merge right, we just return merge left of right and left. So we just switch the arguments. And the idea is really just the same, that now we keep all the values from the right and we align values from the left where they fit and we where they do not fit, we just put none instead. So, and then finally, there's also an outer join, which is really like a union operation, but you still align the things that match together. So, <coughs> to express this in code, we again, we start with the inner join, we make the product, we add everything to merge where it matches directly, and then we just repeat what we did for the left join, we take a set of all the entries, we iterate over it, and say, okay, where it is not already in the merged set, we add a tuple which is of the value left and none, and the same for the right, but we add none and right in this case. And if we look at this here, we see, okay, again, for four, five, and six, we could find pairs that match, but for one, two, and three, we did not find anything on the right, but for seven, eight, and nine, we did not find anything on the left. So and this would be the result of an outer join. And you can also think of an outer join as the union of a left and a right join, so it's also works the same way if you just say, okay, I give, I merge on the left and make a set out of it, I merge on the right and make a set out of it, then I make the union of the left and the right set, and then I sort it and make a list out of it, and the result is then exactly the same. And even a bit nicer because now it's sorted and we see, okay, only in the middle we could find pairs that match. So, and now uh, in pandas it's uh, 
very easy to implement. Uh, you just say, okay, let's consider a data frame uh, containing some information about employees. So we have a bunch of employees here and we have the different groups that they are working in. So some from accounting, some from engineering, some from human resources. And then we also have the hiring dates of different uh, people. So we have, again, we have the names and we have the date that they were hired on. And now we have two informations about the same persons in different tables. Now we want to combine those informations. So and this is where we just can merge the two data frames and we say, okay, just merge them. And uh, as we can see here, we have like for each value in this, in data frame one, we have a corresponding value in data frame two. So this just results in a data frame that is just extended by one column and implicitly pandas already detected that there's a column that has the same name in both data frames and it merges on or joins on this exact column. So we can verify that this matches. Okay, here's Bob. Bob works in accounting and Bob was hired in 2008 and this is now also what we have here in the table. And usually it is better to explicitly say what you want to merge on. So you could say, okay, I want to merge on employee, but the result in this case would be the same. Okay, so now we have a third data frame that contains the salary of uh, those people. However, some the difference here is that now the name of the employees is not, or the column is not named employee anymore, but name instead. However, for us it's not a problem because we can simply say, okay, on the left we want to uh, take employee as the join key and on the right we want to take name as the join key. And pandas will then look for uh, values that match and will not really care about the name of the columns. And this way we can uh, put the things together. However, now we get name duplicated so uh, we could drop a column of those again. Or we can like here we set um, IR. Ah yeah, so usually when you use merge, you would um, you would merge on values. So you would merge on columns. However, it's also possible to merge on indices. So what we do here is now we make uh, versions of our data sets where we do not have a column for the employee, but we have employee as an index. So we just set uh, employee to be the index, and the same here. And now what we can say, okay. Uh, we say merge df1a and df2a and we say left index true and right index true which means uh, do not look for a column to merge on and do not merge on a column anyway but just use the index to merge and uh, usually for a larger data set this is also or should be faster because if you have uh, things on an index uh, you have like usually some kind of data structure that makes it uh, easier to search through so <coughs> yeah, this is how you can merge on different columns or on the indices. And um, yeah, so let's see here, we have now something else. We have some names and we have some ranks. And now if we merge on the rank, we see, okay, if we, uh, it will implicitly uh, merge on the name, but because we have like two columns with the same name in both data frames, pandas will add a postfix uh, to, or a suffix to like uh, these two columns. So uh, we can still distinguish them where they came from. And usually X and Y might not be the most meaningful. You could, so you could specify your own suffixes. So you can say left and right or also something that makes more sense for your use case here. So, and, um, yeah, you can also specify whether you want to do an inner and left or an outer joint by using the how keyword. And we will also see this in a minute. And you can also pass uh, the validated keyword to do some validation on your data frames. And you can also read a lot more uh, in the pandas documentation, which has a lot of visual examples of things. However, we will also see this now, how we could uh, turn our billboard data into a more even more tidy format by splitting uh, it into the songs and the ranks. So um, when we have here, we now have our uh, tidy billboard data and we have our song data here. And now what we can do is we can merge back on the artist, the track and the year and the time. And 
by doing this we will like recombine our uh, original data and put the song ID back in and so similarly you could so what we usually would want to do is um, now we have like this would be the full data however we wanted to split it into two separate tables where we have uh, the songs only in one table and the ranks in the other table and we can do this now because we first uh, we extracted the songs we generated some IDs for them and now we merge back on we now have the ideas in our full data and now we can slice out uh, the rest of the data that does not uh, that has information about the song and uh, this way uh, we can obtain a table that only has information about the ranks and an ID and we have another data frame called songs that only has uh, information about uh, the songs and an ID and now to get the full data back we can just merge on uh, these we can just merge these two data frames back together and say we want to merge on the song ID and or somehow maybe we also cannot because we did some mistake in the meantime however um, or probably you just have a typo in our song Yes, so <laughs> in this way, like we get the original data, but we can store it into two separate tables that are much smaller um, if we uh, than the full table would be. So I think only if we look at like the length of ranks. Okay, so okay, and we still have the full ranks. It's I think not really uh, avoidable, but at least we do not have to store all the data about the songs again. Okay, so let's do an exercise uh, involving merging data. So uh, for this, let's only focus about the common Pokemon that we all know, which are the first nine from the first generation. So, and then we have other data called the type chart, which contains information about like which type is uh, good against which other type. So here we have uh, the type and then it says, okay, it's strong against this, weak against these types, resistant to these types and vulnerable to these types. And this is not really tidy because we now even have multiple values in the same column and whatever. However, we have a small function called normalize here and we can extract a single tidy version of this uh, for strong against. So now this data frame contains the t information about which type is strong against which other types. And so this uh, exercise would be to find like for these uh, common Pokemons uh, to find all the types uh, with against which they are strong. And for doing this, you should take into account both uh, the first and the second type of the common Pokemons. So if like Bulbasaur is a grass Pokemon and we can see, okay, grass, mm, where is it? Here is strong against ground rock and water like now the resulting data frame should contain the information that Bulbasaur is strong against rock, uh, strong against ground and strong against water in three different rows and you can or you should actually need to use uh, merging for this and so you can maybe also start by first focusing on the first type and then try to also get the second type into this and for this you have like five minutes again.
Okay. So, does anyone else already do it? Okay. Then maybe I'll just. I can still show the solution for now. You can still try to figure out your own solution, but maybe let's do the step by step. So to face a problem that we uh, want to merge on type two and type uh, one at once, what I did is I first melted on the uh, on the type so that we have now for the for all the Pokemon that have two types, we should have two entries already. So we have now also some duplicates, I think, here. So for example, Bulbasaur is now in here twice because it's both a grass and a poison Pokemon. Then we can uh, drop the variable column because we do not really care about it. Then we can drop DNA values because these were put here where um, type 2 was not available, but we also do not care about this. And then comes the merge. So here we say, okay, we merge on strong against on the type, and we want to do a left join. So we want to keep all the data that we see below here, and we want to put next to it uh, all the types that are strong against it. So this is like already kind of the solution, but now we want to sort finally on the number and the name, uh, and the number and the type of the Pokemon. And now we see, okay, that Bulbasaur is strong against ground, against rock, against water. And we also see here originally because of uh, which reason this is so. So we also see that it's strong against grass because it's a poison Pokemon, but that it's strong against water because it's a grass Pokemon and so on. So this would be one application of merging stuff into other data. So I think this is it's, that's it already for today. I think we got through most of the lecture actually. So next time we'll talk a bit about putting things together and removing outliers, but that's really already it. So I think next time we'll have a lot of time to start on your homework already, and I will be here to assist you. And also one announcement, because I was asked that some people are writing a midterm exam this week or so, we will prolong the deadline of the current homework to Saturday, I'd say. So yeah. Okay, so then for those writing uh, midterm, good luck with the midterm, and, and see you on Thursday. Thank <laughs> you.